Hello and welcome to The Base Dater. Today we begin the long and epic story of Springfield, Mass. I've been wanting to do a series on Springfield, Worcester, and Boston for a while. They're the three biggest cities in Massachusetts, and along with Providence, are the top four biggest cities in New England. Now, I'm deciding to go in the opposite order of population. So, we're going to go Springfield, the place I basically grew up in, then Worcester, where I was born, and then finally Boston, the hub of the solar system. For today's episode, we'll be talking about William Pinchon, the founder of Springfield, Massachusetts. And we may end up skipping a few interesting details of early Springfield as we intend to follow the story of Pinchon and not go on too long today. But next episode, don't worry, we're going to come back and cover all those details. But again, for today, we go over why Pinchon decided to even come here, how he was one of the original founders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, why Springfield is not a part of Connecticut, and how this man was the reasoning for the first book burning in North America. William Pinchon was born in October of 1590 in a small village named Riddle near Kelmsford in Essex County, England. By the time he was born, his family had already acquired a large amount of land in their local area, but it was his father, John, who eventually bought a farm in Springfield, which was close by to Whittle. That would be where William Pinchon would grow up. It would also be the land for him to eventually inherit at the age of 21. We don't know much about his early life, but we know he eventually married a woman named Anne and had four children, Anna, Mary, Margaret, and John. William ended up serving as a church warden in the small local area of Springfield. This essentially meant that he was the church's business guy. He handled a bunch of different responsibilities, like dealing with their finances or ensuring that the peace was kept, or sometimes helping out in church construction it left him with a variety of skills. It also intensified his ties to religion. He was one of many in Essex County where Puritanism was rampant. And it was these ties to Puritanism that would eventually push him to think about leaving, as his safety was genuinely in question if he stayed. And within a decade and a half of him leaving, civil wars did follow in England. William Pinchon would actually be one of the original men in the Massachusetts Bay Company. He was one of the 12 people who signed the Cambridge Agreement, which stated that the company would be fully in control by people actually living in New England, as opposed to being controlled in London. And in this agreement, they were essentially swearing to one another that they would make the sale across the Atlantic. Now, he got to work immediately. He began to sell his lands, sometimes even at a loss. He was given the job of getting weapons and guns for the company. Specifically, he had to get cannons, swords, muskets, drakes, and lots and lots of black powder. And do it on a budget. Finally, on April 8th, 1630, Pinchon and his family and around 700 other like-minded Puritans finally set sail. And then a few months later in June, they landed in Salem. William Pinchon would initially settle in Dorchester. He went south along with the others from Salem. Unfortunately for him, his wife would die soon after, the mother to all four of his children. But he would remarry quite quickly to Francis Sanford. In this, he attained a stepson, Henry Smith, who was already 20 at the time. The family would then move along to Roxbury. It's clear that Pinchon was quite the respected man, He was not only active locally, but also in the greater colony at large. He would continue to serve as part of the Court of Assistance, and specifically for two years from 1632 to 1634, he was the treasurer. He also spent considerable time dealing with the disbursement and general logistics of armaments that had been brought over since. While he was not really a military man, he had been the one to acquire them in the first place. Now, what was Pinchon doing for his trade? Well, he engaged in the trade of beaver pelts. Back in England, there was an intense desire for these pelts, and they would pay anything to have them. Now, it's important to know that there were already established trade networks and beaver traders here. But he quickly developed close ties with the local Native American tribes and began to learn their language all for the purpose of buying furs from them at good prices. 
Good prices for him, of course. And a lot of the trading with the Native Americans often centered around European goods, but also often used their currency, specifically wampum. Wampum being made of shells that were formed into beads and then made into varying lengths. He was quite successful in Roxbury trading furs. Although, interestingly enough, while back in London these beaver pelts were the hottest fashion, they were banned within the Bay Colony, since they were maybe a bit too flashy for them. The colony had initially looked to monopolize the pelt industry. They knew what they were coming to and tried to get ahead of it. However, levying taxes on the beaver pelts proved to be quite difficult. There was constantly shifting legislation. There would be a tax one year and then quickly repealed, and then followed by a maybe less severe tax, but then repealed again. Luckily for Pinchon, he was quite the businessman. Again, he was the treasurer for a time and was very well trusted to handle the finances. But these taxes annoyed him intensely. He was a heavy proponent of free trade. Made worse, he felt that the taxes he had to pay for being in Roxbury was unfair. The reason being that Roxbury had rocks buried everywhere, and it made it quite difficult to farm. He even refused to pay the taxes, for a time. This annoyance towards his living situation definitely pushed him to think of going elsewhere. But what probably hammered it into his mind that he needed to move was the fact that in eastern Massachusetts, near the bay, trading beaver pelts was getting quite difficult. It seemed lucrative for him to instead move closer to their source. Moving closer to their source meant taking a look at going westwards, specifically the Connecticut Valley. At this same time, there were plenty of other colonists from across New England thinking of going to this area but all were south of Enfield Falls, a place where you had to manually bring your boat up if you wanted to continue up the Connecticut River. Hartford and Windsor were some of these more southern locations. Pinchon felt that going to this area would be best if he wanted to expand his beaver pelt trade. So in 1635, an initial expedition was done. Its goal was to find an area where they could not only set up a trading post, but in fact build an entire town for them and their families. Most likely, he looked along the old Connecticut path that led from the Massachusetts Bay to the River Valley. He navigated through the area looking for good land. He didn't want to be below or south of any of the current towns in the Connecticut colony. He had his mind on trade, and being south of any of these towns could induce issues later on in the future. It was also an issue that being too low into the Connecticut colony would put him next to more warlike tribes of the Native Americans. And so he continued up the river until reaching the mouth of the Agawam, known today as the Westfield River. He heard that in this location there were many Native Americans that caught beavers, and so he decided that that was where they were going to build their first house, and then planned to fully move here soon. Pinchon went back to the bay and continued on with his responsibilities, but fully fantasizing about the fertile Connecticut Valley he had seen. And it's also vital to quickly note that beyond the disease that decimated Native Americans from 1616 to 1619, there had been more recently a smallpox outbreak in 1633 that further reduced their population. This is pretty important to understand because when Pinchon and these other explorative colonists arrived in the Connecticut Valley, there were few Native Americans. Specifically, the tribe of the Pecumtuck was here, and while they had had multiple thousand, it certainly was nothing overly large that would have been able to repel the colonists, even if they wanted to. And so, with the location decided, it was now time to draw up actual legal documentation. This began with an agreement among the first citizens of what would become Springfield. They wrote down goals and rules and desires for this town, specifically even including that as soon as possible, they would get a minister for an eventual church. This initial agreement also laid out how the town's land would be divvied out, and it followed a general rule of fairness. Everyone was going to get the land that they so properly deserved according to what they were bringing to the new town. Such as Pinchon, who would get a ton of the land since he was financing so much, 
but everyone else would still get their fair share. And speaking of land, it was on July 5th, 1636, that the deed of what was initially called the Agawam Plantation was signed. On it, the newly arrived settlers and 13 local Native Americans made their mark. One specific man who was also on this document was Ahatan, who was Pinchon's go-to translator. The land was purchased with wampum, axes, knives, coats, and other items. Interestingly enough, this purchase of land from the local tribe and official deed was something that was actually not common. There had been a general idea among colonists that the land there belonged to them. It was land that God was giving them and that they need not pay any mind to who was already living there. William, however, saw it differently and understood the land to belong to the Native Americans. And while he still had to explain what a deed was and how a transfer of land ownership could even work, he did explain it, and he did purchase the land. Whereas other settlements ended up creating fictitious or most likely fictitious agreements with the Native Americans decades later, when it was time to maybe cover themselves a little bit to be seen as having actually purchased the land when in reality, they almost certainly didn't. They just took it. So the land was now theirs. The Agawam plantation was here. Pinchon had decided that the east side of the river would be where they would build and live. Originally, they had decided on the west side, where West Springfield is today. It was where that first house was actually originally built. But that did not survive. Floods were common in that area, and there were many Native Americans. Pinchon didn't want to be so close to them, and even wrote of how he didn't want to, quote, trespass. A road was made on the west side of the river. That would eventually become Main Street. They would have their houses on the west side of the road, and their land went perpendicular to that. One of the first buildings put up was the sawmill, because, of course, it would be hard to build anything else without at least having that. And during this early stage, canoes were the primary mode of transportation, at least to get across Connecticut. They also used shallops, which were other fairly small ships. Both could be used to get around the issue of traversing the Enfield Falls. There was originally meant to be a maximum of 50 families in Agawam, all given their proportioned land. But not everyone who signed the initial agreement stayed. It fluctuated. But there was a steady stream of people, often invited. Many immigrants would come from Western England and Wales. It's important to also know that at this early stage, the Agawam Plantation was not connected with the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It didn't really fall under its jurisdiction. It would be pretty hard to do so considering Boston was 90 miles east, and the best way to travel there and move goods would be to sail down to Connecticut. So early on, it was technically a part of the Connecticut Valley Colony. Hartford and Windsor and Wethersfield were all much closer and were their river neighbors. However, while this was the case and it made logical sense for them to be politically connected, the relationship would not pan out well. Firstly, for a variety of reasons that I won't fully get into here, a war was brewing with the Pequot tribe. There had been multiple killings of Native Americans and of colonists, all that were maybe a bit shifty and probably not fully connected to the Pequot tribe, but it was attributed to them. There had also been a great hurricane in 1635 that destroyed many buildings and fields of crops. So all of this led to the Pequot War, which Pinchon was not a fan of. He felt that the hostilities that had occurred could not easily be attributed to the Pequot tribe. And when the Connecticut court in Hartford was deciding how to go about this war, Agawam had no representative there. Plus, they essentially decided to just commandeer one of Pinchon's shallops. The war was pretty gruesome, but Agawam and William Pinchon essentially stayed out of it. At least until the end when the leaders of the Pequot tribe were murdered and then taken by the Mohawks and dropped at Pinchon's feet, thinking they were giving it to the Connecticut court. Pinchon dropped everything and rushed to Winthrop so that the war would be ended. It was soon over, and William would receive quite the hefty bill that he was to pay for the war that he 
didn't want to be involved with in the first place. He was also annoyed because he wanted so badly to keep good relations with the locals. He often wrote of how the colonists must take in all the information and not rush to judgment, that they had to treat them with respect and restraint. This put him in a league of his own when it came to respecting the Native Americans. At least compared to his contemporaries, Pinchon had a much different outlook on how to have them as neighbors. Although this most likely stemmed from the fact that they were getting him stinking rich, and any harm to them would mean harm to his business. The relationship with the other Connecticut Valley towns only got worse. Again, Pinchon was close with the natives. So, in 1638, when a deathly food shortage was right around the corner, it was decided in the Connecticut court that Pinchon would be the liaison for acquiring corn for everyone. He was given this task, and he tried to accomplish it. But it was difficult, considering that corn storages were low for the natives themselves, and the prices weren't good enough. And so, Pinchon failed, and reported his failure. But the Connecticut court deemed that he hadn't done enough, and so sent Captain Mason to forcibly get the corn, a man who had been elbow deep in the bloody Pequot War just years previous. He failed too. They then decided to, and I quote, to declare unto them that we have a desire to speak with them, to know the reasons why they said they are afraid of us, and if they will not come to us willingly, then to compel them to come by violence. Right after that, that same Connecticut court then decided that Pinchon had broken his promise to acquire the corn, and this led to him basically getting sued. He would have to defend himself in the public court of opinion, and even wrote an apology that got ridiculed. This would really be the end of Agawam pairing itself with the other Connecticut towns. Later in that same year of 1638, Pinchon would request to be part of Massachusetts again. Eventually, the Bay Colony would flex its power and state that Agawam was under its jurisdiction. From this, they would change its name to be based on the area where Pinchon grew up. Officially, on April 16, 1640, Agawam was now Springfield. The relationship between Connecticut would certainly get worse over time and occasionally better, but one example of worseness was when Connecticut attempted to pressure defense taxes onto Springfield. They stated that it was needed for upkeep of their Fort Saybrook at the end of the Connecticut River. This sparked quite the issue and was quickly resolved when the Bay Colony, extending the logic a bit farther, stated that all of them would have to pay taxes to Massachusetts, since Boston and the Boston Harbor defended them all. Connecticut quickly dropped the issue. During the 1640s, Springfield would be labeled New England's Wheat Belt. Pinchon's beaver trade prospered nicely, but it was during this time, around when the English Civil Wars were going on, that the flow of people from England came to a halt, even maybe went in reverse. Back home, England was even getting a bit more free when it came to religion. A big reason for leaving in the first place was to escape the clamping down on Puritanism. Pinchon, of course, had no reason to head back. He was making an incredible amount of money that would end up infuriating others. He was intensely rich. And he was spreading roots in this new world. His children were getting married and spreading out across the expanse of land. But this would change soon enough. As the years creeped by, Pinchon gained in age. In 1650, he was 60 years old, and while his devotion to religion had always been present in his life, it was in these later years that he devoted more and more time to writing. He published his book, The Meritorious Price, in 1650. In this, he wrote of the suffering of Christ. It was Jesus that suffered and died for all of our sins. God forgave us because Jesus took on this intense pain. Pinchon wrote that the suffering of Christ could not have been that bad. Basically, he stated that Jesus Christ was not really a regular human. He was sent by God. He did not die until he actually decided to let himself die. And that meant that he could not have experienced the same true suffering as regular humans did. 
he was different. Now, I'm not really too religious, and it's all quite complicated, but that was essentially the gist of it. But I do want to quote David M. Powers from his book Damnable Heresy here, as I thought he explained it incredibly well when he said, For Pinchon, there could be no imputation or transfer of guilt from the party responsible to somebody else. There could certainly be no imputation of humankind's sin to Christ. That would result in a catch-22. If God had imputed our sins to Christ, he would be blemished and no longer qualified to be the Immaculate Lamb of God. And in that case, Christ could not have been a fit person in God's esteem to do the office of a mediator for our redemption. Now, all of this really set Boston aflame. Literally. This book pissed off the leaders of Boston so much that they burned it, they condemned it, and they even brought up the word heresy. They paid a man to write an entire book against it and called for Pinchon to report to Boston so they could yell at him and tell him why he was wrong. And Pinchon and this man, Norton, had this argument. And Pinchon apologized, somewhat which pleased the Puritan leaders of Boston a bit, but they demanded more, and Pinchon was not really willing to give it to them. He believed in what he wrote, and with the word heresy brought up, it was clear that Pinchon was no longer welcome here. He lost his political position and was called to come back to Boston to give a greater apology and statement of understanding that he was wrong. He knew he had to get out of here and so got ready to go to England. He gave all of his holdings to his son John Pinchon, his stepson Henry Smith, and now his son-in-law, Eliza Holyoke. When he initially did not show up, they decided to give him more time. They even wrote that a fine of £100 would need to be paid if he still didn't show. But, of course, he never did. England, as mentioned earlier, was looking much freer religiously. And so, a man whose original reasoning for leaving involved religious freedom found that the place he had helped create was now less free than the place he had felt forced to abandon. William Pinchon would continue to write many more books, all the way to his death. He would die on October 29th, 1662, never to return to North America. Springfield would, of course, continue on. Now, John Pinchon would continue the family business. In fact, William continued it as well, but now from the London side of it. John may have even been better than his father was. John had already been the treasurer of Springfield in the late 1640s. He had married the daughter of the Connecticut governor during that same time as well. So when William did leave, it was only natural for him to step up and he was well prepared to do so. Him and Eliza Holyoke took the mantle going into the 1650s and would be elected as magistrates, and were directly involved in the disbursement of land going forward. John would begin to invest in Springfield heavily. He put down 200 pounds to create a mill for grain. He was then given more land to create a sawmill. And he continued along the same lines of thinking as his father, which was that the local tribes were to be respected, and he even wrote in the late 1650s that he wished the English would not meddle so much. John was quite rich by the time his father died, and when he went to England to settle the estate, the will he found gave him hundreds more acres to do with as he pleased. William Pinchon was vital to those early years of Springfield, and his family continued to be the wealthiest. As they prospered, so did Springfield. John would continue to lead Springfield and create more and more projects for the town. Eliza Holyoke and Henry Smith would do the same. Pinchon and those around him would shape the area for decades to come. And his legacy is still remembered today in the fact that there is an award named after him, the Pinchon Award, given out by the Advertising Club of Western Massachusetts since 1915. The story of John Pinchon and Eliza Holyoke and many others is expansive, but that'll be for the next episode on this series of Springfield. We'll also go over a couple details that I kind of breezed over during this one, like the first witch trials. 
I didn't want to go jumping around too much and mostly wanted to focus on William Pinchon. But there's a lot more to tell. Next episode, we'll cover all of that. The darkest days of Springfield are about to be here as well, as Kink's Phillips War, the deadliest war per capita in North America, is coming. And Springfield will not be spared. As always, if you have any comments or questions or inaccuracies to point out, feel free to email us at contact at Thank you so much for listening, and I cannot wait to continue this amazing story.